it'll be absolutely fine, but uh, thank you so much for the two years for uh, coming on. It's uh, appreciated, no that you, appreciated that you take the time out of your, your evening to come on and speak to myself. But before we get started, how are the two of you doing? Great, good. Yeah, yeah. as well as expected under the circumstances. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to go back and we're going to talk about all things music for the two of yous, and then as obviously talking about uh, the duo as well. But uh, going right back to the very start for both of you, I'll let you both answer, but where did you both grow up? Northeast of England for me. I, I grew up, uh, I was born in Yeovil, <coughs> and then Fort William, and then Aberdeenshire, and then the Borders. All over the place. And, and were, the, were the two of you both into music from a very young age when you were growing up? Yeah. Yeah, very much so. Yeah. And what what was your earliest musical influences? Was that music coming from your parents? Or like what, what type of music were you exposed to when you were very young? My, my parents were into things like, like... My dad was a big Jimmy Shan fan, right. accordion player. Um, they weren't really, you know, they, they weren't music aficionados at all. Um, and then I started, I got a guitar when I was about 10 years old and uh, started taking lessons. And my second guitar teacher when I was about 14 or 15, mm -hmm. um, into country music. So that got me listening to country music um, when everybody else at school was listening to, um, you know, Led Zeppelin and stuff like that. So I used to get bullied a lot. Right. And, uh, um, from that, I started playing in country bands, like um, lead guitar in country bands. Did yeah. that till, till the mid eighties. By which time, I'd kind of gotten into the periphery of country music, um, the kind of stuff that's called Americana now, but that term didn't exist then. Yeah. So it was people like Di Clark, Tams Van Zandt, and uh, Michael mm. Nesmith. Mm -hmm. um, and then that evolved into the kind of the, the people that I listen to now, which is you know Warren Zevon, Jackson Brown, Peter Case, David yeah. Lee, James McMurtry, Pat McLaughlin, Roddy Crawl. Yeah, there's, there's a few names in there that we'll talk about later on. But what about for yourself? Um, what music were you exposed to from a young age, and then you can take it from there. When I, when I was very young, my dad used to gig. And we often went along to the gigs, you know. I remember sleeping in duffel coats while he was playing. Yep. So that was just the kind of thing that happened then. So that was all the old songs. <coughs> so I was introduced to like Eddie Cocker and Buddy Holly, people like that. I remember like Michelle Shocked being played in the house and artists like that, Leonard Cohen and Neil Diamond and just that kind of thing. So, yeah. And then obviously you you were also exposed to the to the live gigging circuit as yeah. well. Yeah. But, but so obviously music from a very young age, you've obviously touched on this already, but I was going to say, was there a... Normally people that I've spoke to previously, you know, they'll be influenced by what their parents listen to and then there's normally an age where they discover their own musical taste. But would you say your musical taste just continued right along the same lines as your parents? Not for me. No? No, I, I think those the people that I liked then, I kind of continue to like, but then I discovered more and still do today. You know, it's like yeah. Paul introduced me to James McMurtry just not long ago. Absolutely love him. So it's yeah. like I'm missing that all my life, you know. So I, I love when you get introduced to a gem that you're like, well, that's fantastic. It's funny that it's funny that he's mentioned that specific artist right because th this is just a pure coincidence but uh, back in 2017 um, James McMurtry was playing through at the Oran Moor in Glasgow remember it yeah he played yeah. Clooney in Newcastle on the same tour yeah and uh, I had his support act Nathan Bell was on oh, yeah. a few episodes ago I was speaking to him oh and, really great yeah, yeah and we were laughing because the reason that we, we the re, the reason that we discovered James McMurtry was that just pure coincidence. My dad's name is James McMurtry, 
Yeah. And what happened was, I think he was on holiday somewhere, and he'd seen someone with a James McMurtry T-shirt on. And he was thinking to himself, why is this guy wearing a T-shirt with my name on it? He got speaking to him, didn't realise it was an actual musician, and then obviously discovered him. So when he came to Glasgow, he'd said to me, let's go along and we'll see him in concert. And then we discovered Nathan Bell as well. And I'm actually going to see Nathan in concert. He's in Glasgow again Thursday next week. So we're going along to meet him. But um, James McMurtry was good. I, actually, I think I preferred probably Nathan Bell. Um, there, there was another support band, but... Was he solo on that tour with a band? No, I think he was just he was just him by himself. Yeah. But I, I think he'd said to me that was his first time um, getting exposure in Glasgow, but ever since then it kind of got the ball rolling. Yeah, I think... With yeah, I, I, I've seen him in I've seen him in London and I've seen him in Austin a few times. Yeah. Uh, until well, until he died, he had Ian McLaughlin from the Small Faces in his band playing keyboards. Right. Okay. Incredible. He used to do the uh, the midnight the Wednesday night midnight show at the uh, Continental Club right. in Austin, and so whenever I was there, I always made sure I went to that gig. But it's funny as well. Some of the artists that you'd mentioned previously, I was listening to to your um, songs on YouTube and that today. Then I like to kind of just have a wee, you know, listen. Who does it sound like to me? See if I can try and figure out the influences and, and you were naming some of them. So uh, I've got Warren Zevin yep. uh, there. If you actually listen to um, Bruce Springsteen doing acoustic stuff, there's a lot of it kind of falls into that as well, which is pretty yep. cool. You've got like your Leonard Skinner, you've got your C6 Steve, which then goes into obviously all your bluesy type stuff but um, it was really cool stuff and I, I, I like what, what you are doing you know when, when you hear your music if you were to close your eyes it, it's not it doesn't sound like two guys it sounds like there's a lot more which I really like that's what we're trying to do with the, the <clears throat> we're trying to make the recordings that we're doing at the moment sound like we sound live yeah so there's a there's a little bit of overdubs things like shakers and cymbals which we don't have live Mm -hmm. But generally, and we do some studio trip with double tracking on the on the rhythm instruments, and yep. we put some extra harmony vocals on. But generally, the recordings that we've made um, and the album that we're in, that we're doing at the moment is pretty much uh, what we sound like live. Yeah. So give us give us a wee laugh, and this might give you might end up laughing at each other as well. But do you both remember the first um, music album that you've ever bought with your own money? Yeah. Go on. Right. It was two. I bought Simon Garfunkel's Greatest Hits right. and a Mark Boland compilation. Why go? What it was called. Uh, but it wasn't the album, it was a compilation. I have a feeling mine was Sleep with Mark's Rumours. Right, right, okay. Neither of those are particular. None of those are particularly embarrassing, are they? Nah, they're, they're pretty good. Do you, do you remember the first professional concert that you've ever attended first professional ever attended I, I went to see the shadows and I loved it yeah yeah I think it was Elvis Costello at Sunderland Mayfair or was it in Mayfair oh, I don't know that was Newcastle Mayfair can't remember what the um, uh, venue what the venue was but it was um, no the Mecca in Sunderland and uh it was at the height of the punk era. Right. Um, and there was two things that stood out, is that the, the queue to get in was full of Mohicans and, and bondage trousers, and me, yeah. just like probably not quite 17, were dressed really straight, but were the only ones who didn't get searched on the way in. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the gig got stopped halfway through. Uh, it, because um, the, front, the the entire mosh pit one was, was spinning at him, so yeah. did that stops or uh, or I stop. So uh, yeah, that was a fun gig. That's not too bad then. So you both play the guitar. Was the guitar your first instrument that you were both drawn to? Yeah. Yep. Definitely. Did you did you consider any other instruments, or was it always a guitar for yourself? For me, it was. Um, I, I really wasn't inter that interested in music or musical instruments and it was a bunch of, uh, of um, 
the kids in the it was in the first year of, of uh, uh, first year of Catholic grammar school. I'm still recovering. A um, uh, bunch of the kids that that were in my class who were the, like the cool kids um, decided they were getting guitars for Christmas. So I said, "Oh, I fancy that." So I did. And my, my dad said, "Well, you, you're going to go to lessons." Yeah. So I did, and for me, it became a career. And and I, I think the, the rest of them didn't last. They didn't last six months with it. So yeah, yeah it was just, it was um, it, it was a whim uh, that turned into a uh, into an obsession. And did your did your lessons did, was that just to te- teach you the basics, and then did you learn everything else by yourself? I had a, three or four years of classical guitar lessons where I was doing grades, um, which I wasn't really into. But it, I mean, it, it, I reaped the benefits of that because you know the, the, the understanding of music theory, even just basic music theory, is so important. And then uh, got lessons from a guy who um, was playing around in club bands, and he introduced me to the club band scene and started playing in working men's clubs and then playing, doing the country thing, and then. That evolved by the mid eighties into kind of like a more of a rock thing. Um, so yeah. What about singing? Because that's always overlooked. You know, everyone's got that, their instrument that they play. But um, how how did you get into singing? I couldn't. To, to use a quaint old Geordie expression, I can't shout "Call down a passage." You're not uh, even. Doing, I thought you'd done some backing singing. I do. Yeah, I, I do, but I'm not. I, you know, I'm not confident with it. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I'll have a go, but I wouldn't call myself a singer by any stretch of the imagination. Ryan's a singer. So, Ryan, how did you get into singing? Yeah, even that's a stretch, probably. <laughs> but, uh, no, I just always wanted to, and it, it was not naturally at all. I was a terrible tone deaf. You know, when I, when I started, even when I was, started playing guitar, it was terrible. Started singing, it was terrible. And it's just taken years and years and years and years to just just to kind of be in tune, you know. Just to learn to slur into a note because I can't hit it, you know. That's taken a, taken a long time. Yeah, I mean, singing is a, is a funny one because, you know, if you play the guitar or the drums or the bass, you can get lessons for it. You can learn from other people. You know, nowadays you can obviously just go onto YouTube and type in whatever you want. But singing's still that one instrument where you know you can get lessons. You can get shown how to do it. What's right? What's wrong? But there is a huge part of it falls directly under confidence, and, and you can't teach that yet. You've either got it or you've not, or you you know you will develop it over time as well. But there, there's a lot of people that probably shy away from it and it's maybe sometimes who's the bravest person to step in front of the microphone or as you say it takes years to just sort of get comfortable with within your own skin when you're singing the, the strange thing is that like i'm more than happy to sing now and i thoroughly enjoy it but i don't really like talking paul does all the talking all the mm-hmm. back jokes all paul and I, I just tend to sit quiet and then do the singing well here, here's a question for you ryan you play the guitar and you sing. Is there one that you think you're better at than the other? Uh, I, no, actually, I, I, I don't consider myself like a, a pro at either. So I kind of think that the combination gives me something that's maybe a little distinctive as mine, but only only as a combination, not, not as separate items. Yeah. So... Um, if we fast forward, I know that the band started, or the duo started around 2017 time. Yeah, yeah that's so how did it how did it come together? I was running um, a gig in uh, in Hoyk, <coughs> uh, where I live, um, every, and we ran this from uh, 2014 up until the pandemic. And it was every Monday night, and it was kind of a roots Americana, bluesy, folky, whatever kind of thing. And we booked touring acts with an opening act, and then we'd always have kind of a um, a bit for not an open mic, but we rather than just to keep the quality there, we'd invite people along to do like a short set in the middle. And I was doing a gig with um, another with an act that I used to work with. 
and Ryan was doing that particular spot because they did something similar. Mm -hmm. Yep. And uh, I said to him, I really like the stuff. You should be. I do this thing, and you know, and you should come down. And then he didn't for about two years because mm -hmm. um, he was busy renovating a house. So um, <clears throat> he did. Uh, I think you had a percussionist with you as well at that time. Yeah. And I was absolutely blown away by the song, so I said, uh, I said look, if, you, if you're looking for a guitar player, um, you know, I love the songs, I'm your man. Yeah. So um, we took it from there. And how did you come up with the band name? Was there other alternatives to the one you ended up with? Oh, there was any number. Uh, it took a long time. But yeah. um, uh, for a laugh, I, I saw uh, Ryan's a big... Um, uh, JJ Kale fan yeah. and I was looking through often song titles or album titles that could be inspiration for um, for band names yeah but looking through um, a JJ Kale discography and he has a song called Durango so um, for a laugh I said right we should call ourselves Durango Durango and we can be the Americana Duran Duran uh, <laughs> right so, it was intended as a joke, but then I kind of we both kind of realised that Durango as a um, as a name kind of was, was pretty pretty good. Mm -hmm. So, we kind of like two word names. So I was coming. I made this list of secondary words that would go with it. There was things like the Durango conspiracy and you know things like that. And yeah. I said, right, I'll come up with the first one. You come up with the second one, and I don't care what it is. That'll be it. So he's your favorite, favorite, favorite color. Stick to color. Yeah. <laughs> so. so it kind of works. Yeah. It's good though because sometimes um, you know I've had I've laughed before that there's there's bands that I've I've seen that I've known there's bands I've been in that the band is split up before you ever done your first gig because people start arguing they can't decide on a band name and you know you try. You know, everybody's got their, their idea of what's good, what's bad. Sometimes band names, you know, they don't mean anything. Kind of, it's just like something don't. that stands out. Sometimes that's the best name. Yeah. I think anyway. But um, with the duo, um, is it just all original songs or do you also do covers? We do a handful of covers, but they're not exactly... I mean, if I, you know, I only really announced them as covers as a courtesy. <laughs> we, could, <laughs> we, we do a few things. We do, um, we do a couple of David Lindley things. Uh, we do his version of um, uh, Your Old Lady, which is an early 60s Isley Brothers song. Uh, we do his version of Mercury Blues. We do um, J.J. Kale's Call Me The Breeze and You Got Something. We do, we do a couple of McMurtry songs. Mm -hmm. um, we do a song by an old friend of mine um, who died a couple of years ago, quite a famous folk singer called Kieran Halpin. Um, mm -hmm. We do a version of the Dusty Springfield hit, Spooky. But, you know, like imagine if that, like, Ry Cooder had played on the original, that would, yeah. that's the kind of vibe it's got. So as your standard set list, there's a, one or two covers maybe thrown in for a bit of fun, but it's mostly originals. Mostly original, yeah. Right. Yeah. And um, who is it that, that I, I was noticing when I was watching your videos, you've also got the, the feet percussion. Yeah. yeah. Who is it that's doing that? That's me. Yourself. <laughs> How did that come about, Ryan? Like, when did you actually come, start yeah. doing that? When, when we got together, <clears throat> all I used to bring was a guitar. Now I've got loads of kit. Just, just keeps getting bigger and bigger and more and more stuff. What happened was that when we first, when we were first rehearsing, we had a percussionist um, who left to join another band. And when you're used to the percussion and it just becomes two acoustic guitars, it sounds a bit empty. Yeah. I mean, that must just be psychological. But it, you know, so at the time, I had a, an online retail business doing music stuff, and I was selling these. Um, uh, stomp boxes. Yeah. But normally they're just like blocks of wood with a with a piezo sensor in, but these had a digital sample in. So when you hit them, it triggered a sample of a kick drum or a tambourine or whatever. So we got a few of those, three of those, I think. 
and and we did that for for quite a while. But because they're being pounded constantly, they they, they become unreliable. Yeah, they so um, uh, I figured out what the triggers were, and they're, they're incredibly simple. So I made some triggers, uh, and then bought um, a, a drum brain from an electronic drum kit. Right. So they just plug into that, and uh, so we can set up three kits. So we we always have a kick uh, and cymbals, and then as the uh, if the, depending on whether it's a laid back song or a more rocky song, we change a kit from a like a, a tambourine uh, to a, a snare drum, and then yeah. to like, kind of rim shot. It's yeah. side stick snare. You won't hear that on YouTube because we haven't recorded with that set up yet, but. It, mm -hmm. it, it, Gives us a lot of uh, variation, so we can push. You know, we can rock a lot more. Right. It's true what you say, though. I mean, I, I do gigs, acoustic gigs myself, uh, in the pubs. So I'm playing the guitar, I'm singing, and uh, I've got a stomp box, which I introduced a couple of years ago now, and it's uh, I, I can't do it without it now because yeah, it's a huge it, it just adds something to the bottom end. And it's a great device as well, depending on what song you're doing. See if you're wanting, if you've got a bit of a crowd in and you want them to, if you're trying to control them, if it's clapping along or that, you know, it's a, it's a great way just to kind of get people going. You can slow it right down. You can start up. Yep. And amazing the amount of friends I've got that have tried it and, and they're not comfortable doing it. I don't know if it's they, they can't keep the beat going. I'm almost, I've went completely the opposite way that, I feel like I play worse if I'm not doing it. Mm -hmm. But I even done a I even done a gig just on just two days ago, and there was a an American couple in, just like tourists that were in, and the guy played the guitar and he came up to me after it to ask what what is it you're using on your your foot there and it was loving the sound and you know just as exactly as as I've, as I've explained there it adds something extra. Yep. Yeah, and it's weird because now when I go along and I hear other people playing, doing this, the same setup that I've got, I feel like when they're not playing with a stomp box, there's just something for me that's just missing. Uh, but it, it, sound, it sounds great what you were doing. I think I've seen stuff on Facebook because there definitely was a snare drum in that in there. That would be uh, fairly recent. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah we, we've, we've been running that setup for about three or four months now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, obviously, that's the setup that you've got. With regard to songwriting, how do you go about songwriting? So, what is your? Do you have a method to it? Ryan does all the songwriting. Um, then he brings a song to me, and we'll just jam over it, and then I'll decide what <coughs> instruments. I, so I'll either play um, regular guitar, yep. electric lap steel, dirty yep. electric lap steel, or. Uh, acoustic lap steel Weissenborn So is, is uh, Ryan are you basically doing the, the skeleton of the song the verse chorus that sort of thing and then and then you start contributing to, to build it from there Yeah I mean mo most times I've pretty much got a finished song Yeah he brings a finished song to me and then no, It's not always the case sometimes I'll bring a bit to see what happens and then mm -hmm. that hire me to write the rest of it you know Right not sure, but usually it's a finished song in in terms of the melody and the words and the choruses. So, and then we'll we'll organise the structure. You know how do you want the yep. intro? What do you want for a solo and all that? Yep. And you kind of you, you sort of touched on this earlier, but you, I'm assuming when you are recording in the studio, um, are you recording live or are you are you doing it to a clip track or how do you go about recording? Every, we put basic track down with, uh, with Ryan playing DI'd, guitar DI'd, <clears throat> foot drums, and a rough vocal. And, and, and I'll play too. along with that, again, plugged in. <clears throat> and then once we've got that, um, we, go, we go in again and duplicate the, um, the original rhythm parts with really high-quality mics. Uh, and then then ditch the the, the di'd parts, um, and then we can use the the like the foot triggered drums to trigger um, samples. Do you do you enjoy the recording process, creating something from nothing? 
Very much so. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Back in, mm -hmm. in a previous life, I used to teach that. I used to teach studio recording at Teesside University. Right. And what about um, when you when you when you see how music is accessed today? Um, so you will be similar to myself. Years ago, um, you know, I was brought up before the internet. You know, so if you wanted, you would go to a music shop when they still existed. You know, and you would go into a music shop and you would be flicking through the records or the CDs that you liked, and you know you would pick up pick out ones that you'd been recommended, but you, you would also purchase ones having never heard the band before, and it would be simply based upon the artwork. You think that's a great album cover. I'm going to get that, and you know you've got to wait till you get home <coughs> to find out whether it's a good buy or not. And um, obviously. The way that music is accessed nowadays, you know, you get downloading, you get streaming, all this sort of stuff. There'll be a whole generation of people that probably won't really think that artwork's that important. Do you still think artwork is important when you're creating like an album or an EP? Yes. But the, the, for me, it's not just the artwork. It was the sleeve notes. And the credits. Yeah. Because I got into, <clears throat> I'd buy an album, listen to the tracks, and I'd hear a, uh, a an instrumentalist, or you know, um, and I'd go then, or I'd, I'd like the song, and look at the, the the writing credits, and then go buy albums by that songwriter. Yeah. But um, I got into loads of people just by 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 that means, just by you know, songwriting credits or, um, you know, who was who played guitar on that, who played pedal steel on that, who played bass on that, you know. It's almost, it's almost depends who you ask. Personally, I think it's a bit of a shame the, the way things have kind of went because when I was younger, the other thing, you didn't have the internet, so if you owned 15 CDs or 15 records, you knew those 15 CDs or records inside out because you didn't have anything else to choose from. So you would listen to them from yep. start to end. You would study the notes inside. You'd study the lyrics. You would look, you know, the, the track listing, the order that it went in meant something because this song had to come yep. first, followed by this song. And, you know, the, that whole sort of thing is lost. But there is still people that that, that really is important. And, you know... I, Hope that maybe kind of comes back around. I don't know how how it'd be possible the way that um, the way things are going, but it would be a shame if that was lost because I I personally think it's still very important. The C I think the CD was a pivotal moment because if you know if you look at the history of, of recorded music from the you know the late eighteenth century, sorry nineteenth century, late eighteen hundreds, yeah, up until nineteen eighty. Everything was an improvement. Technology got better and better, and you know. <clears throat> and then CDs happened, um, and the only advantage with CDs is they were less fragile. You know, you, they were more difficult to wreck. Um, but since since the whole MP3 streaming things come in, I mean, some people only know what music sounds like from an mp3 through a pair of 99 pence earbuds so yeah that's not what music sounds like yeah uh, and, and the, lo losing the idea of, of an album as a you know a set of songs as a as a, a an entire work yeah. rather than 12 or 10 separate statements i think is is, is devaluing um the art form yeah yeah, I, I, would, I would agree as well. But uh, question for the both of you. Do you prefer writing and recording to performing live? Is, is there one you prefer over the other? I prefer, yeah, yeah. I prefer one of them. Can we say that again? I prefer performing to, um, uh, to recording. Um, <clears throat> that, that said, they are the different things. Somebody once used the analogy that recording is like an architect designing a house whereas mm -hmm. playing live 
is like giving a child a piece of paper and a crayon and saying, draw a house. <laughs> so different things and they serve different purposes. Yeah, and some of my gigs have have sounded about as scrappy as that picture could probably be by that child. Matter. It doesn't matter, it's ephemeral. You know, yeah. it's like, I, I don't really like live albums that much because uh, it, it wasn't the purpose. You know, the the, the um, the, uh, a live performance isn't necessarily something that should be captured for posterity. I mean, it, you know, there's arguments for and against that, but, yeah. you know, a li live is live, recording is recording. Both are great. Yeah. So, so we're, we're still in the first half of 2024. So what is the plans for the, the rest of the year? Uh, we have music to get. Mixed, mastered, and yeah, released. Yeah, we've, we've got about eight tracks to finish um, on top of all that we did pre-pandemic. So we've got some festivals coming up, uh, and we've got a bunch of gigs coming up. Yeah, we have to do video as well. Uh, yeah. Priorities, we need to shoot some. So we've got to shoot video. some new video. We haven't shot video since 2020, mm -hmm. probably, probably before that. Other than what, um, uh, you know, uh, audience members have shot and, and uploaded. Yeah. But it sounds like these are busy, but um, we've obviously been quite serious up to this point, quite technical with the, the music chat. So uh, before we end things, I'm going to end things on by asking you some fun questions. Okay. Get your opinion, get both your opinions. So if you could go back in time and imagine you could attend any concert in the world, what would be the one concert that you wish that you could have attended, that you could have witnessed? Oh, too many. Mm. I wish uh, I'd seen Tom Petty. Tom Petty, mm. yeah. Linda Ronstadt. Yeah? I wish you'd seen Linda Ronstadt. Or, um... Actually, I wish I'd seen the Plimsolls. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> so many answers that you could give. Oh. Uh, Tom so, Petty and JJ Kale would be my, mm -hmm. my main one. As a, I've been quite fortunate as a as a promoter. I've, I've, I've actually worked with a lot of the a lot of my musical heroes. Right. Okay. Um, which has been fun. So and is it is it true what they say? Never never meet your hero. Sometimes, sometimes not very. Sure. No, most of them, mo most of the guys who you know I, I was really into that I ended up promoting shows for. A couple of them have become very good friends, um, but yeah. one or two were just, um, just, you know, it kind of sound. A disappointment. Yeah, a real disappointment, yeah. Right, next question then. Imagine that you could, um, you got the opportunity to write with any musician, dead or alive. Who's somebody that you wish that you could have sat down and either jammed with or maybe wrote a song with? It's a good question. I, I, I really like Mark Knopfler's songwriting. Yeah. I think he's a very good writer. I think he would have been fun to write with. And also Tracy Chapman, she's so cool, you know, I just love yeah. her. Yeah. It'd be nice to work with her. Cool. I would have probably, probably gone back a bit earlier than that and gone to some, like, some of the great... I, early 60s country writers like Harlan Howard and Hank Cochran. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, another question then, so as you know, there is millions and millions of great songs that have been recorded over the years. What is a song for each of you that you wish you could have been in the recording studio to witness it being recorded? Wales of London by Zevon. Yeah, uh, that's, uh, you know, both sides now. Johnny uh, Mitchell. Aye, uh, that's just such yeah. a fantastic song. And then the, the last question for you, uh, Mount Rushmore, for each of you, who is the four either bands or musicians for yourself, just personally, that you think is just the top of the pile? Well, JJ is definitely, that's, there's no question there. Probably JJ... Bob Seeger, yep. Tom Petty, who would be my fourth. Maybe Tina Turner. All right. 
Didn't yeah. see that coming. Oh, she just sings like no deal on the planet. It's fantastic. <laughs> For me, it would be David Lindley, Ry Cooder, Michael Nesmith, and Peter Case. Cool. I love that last question because it doesn't matter who I speak to, doesn't matter what style they're known for, everybody gives a completely different answer. And, uh, and there's no right or wrong answer, but it's great just to sort of hear, you know, what, what different people sort of think. And I don't think there's anybody that's gave, this is the, I think this is the 32nd episode, and I don't think yet anybody has gave the same answer as the, the previous yeah. person. But uh, thank you so much for coming on. It's been a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you. And uh, thank you. I do wish you all the success in the future. I'll keep a wee eye on you on social media. And uh, when you've got anything to advertise, you give me a shout and I'll get that shared up on uh, social media as well. But uh, thank you for talking and I look forward to hearing these new songs when they come out as well. Yeah, we'll give you a shout when that happens. That's great. Right, thanks guys. Thank you. Thanks very much. Cheers.